and welcome and thank you everyone for coming here and i am tom uh, i am the co-author of the package actually boost and currently i am a master student in simon fraser university in vancouver and here's the overview of today's uh, topics the first is a brief introduction and basic walkthrough and next is a real world application that is about Higgs boson competition on Kaggle. Uh, and it was in last year. So if you want to download the data, you can visit Kaggle and search for Higgs boson. Then you can find, find the competition. And the next one is one of the focus today. I want to introduce the model behind extra boost today in, in details so that you have a chance to understand um, what is going on when you are using this model. And next is after you have an understanding of the model, um, I will introduce the parameters we offer it so that you know what they're doing in the model so you have a better idea to, uh, to tune them in order to get a better performance. And following is the advanced features or highlights in Extra Boost. There are um, some features in the package so that you can uh, use them to help you to get a better result or save your time. And the last one is a Kaggle winning solution. I am going to uh, demonstrate how you can achieve in top 10 with a single extra boost on the former previous very simple Kaggle competition, but it's still a Kaggle competition. I heard this keyword previously in some of your introduction, right? OK, let's get started. Um, the first is introduction. So generally speaking, we can and classify our machine learning models into the following categories. The first is um, regression and maybe the KNN and SVM and tree-based models. They are a single tree and random forest or gradient boosting machine and neural networks. It's a very large um, a class of models. And extra boost is short for extreme gradient boosting. It is an open source tool it has its computation in C++, and it has R, Python, and Julia interface provided. And the model, it is a variant of gradient boosting machine, so it's a tree-based model. And it is also the winning model or winning tool for several Kaggle competitions. And Extra Boost is currently hosted on GitHub. So here is the page. Um, the MLC is... Um, distributed learn, uh, machine learning common. So there are a lot of machine learning libraries or tools in this organization. So Extra Boost is one of them. So if you want to visit the, this page, you just type github.com and uh, DMLC and Extra Boost. So you can um, take a look. This is our GitHub page. And the primary author of the model and the C++ implementation is Tianqi. And he is currently a PhD in University of, of Washington. And um, this is me, and I am the author for the R package and some minor improvements. And actually, Boost is widely used for Kaggle competitions. So why people use it? The first is it is really easy to use. It is easy to install, and there are highly developed R and Python interface for users. And it is efficient. Um, the highlight of it is it can automatically parallel the computation on a single machine. If you have a multi-threaded CPU, which is a standard deployment in, uh, nowadays, I guess. And next is accurate. It can't be just fast, and it has to be very accurate. It has good results for most data sets that is suitable for a tree-based model. And it's very feasible you can use your customized objective and evaluation function. And there are a lot of tunable parameters. OK, so now here's the basic walkthrough. To install it, just run this simple sentence. Uh, this command, um, we use the uh, install underscore GitHub. This command from the DevTools package and uh, specify the location here. And the R package is in the subdirectory. And, and this command requires you to compile this package on your own computer. So if you're using Windows, so you need to install an R tools, um, this one. So, uh, 
I suppose a lot of you have installed it. And then uh, to prepare it, just require or library extra boost. And these two data sets are the demo data set uh, along with the package. And this data set includes information of some mushrooms and they have a lot of attributes and the attributes are noted by binary, uh, so zero and one. So they're indicating they have this attribute or not. And the target is whether this mushroom is poisonous or not. And the structure of the, the training data or the feature set, it is a sparse matrix. So you can see here this DGC matrix is the name of a sparse matrix object. So that um, a sparse a matrix class, this is an object of this class, um, which means we take the um, sparse matrix into this model. So even if your uh, dimension is really high, as long as your data is sparse, we can also train this model efficiently. So to use XRBoost to do uh, classify these poisonous mushrooms, we need to provide the following information. These are the minimum requirements. The first is the input features, and the second is the target variable, and the third is the objective, uh, specifying we are training uh, for linear regression or logistic regression. And the, uh, the last one is the number of iterations. This model contains a lot of trees, so we have to specify how many trees do we want. So here's the command. XGBoost, this is the training, uh, this is the main function for training the model. And data is taking the feature matrix. And label is taking the target. And n round is the number of rounds we want to uh, we want our model to train, which means the uh, number of trees as well, and the objective. Here we are train uh, we are doing a binary classification, so our objective is the binary clone logistic. And these two lines are in the information printed by extra boost. This is a training error. And sometimes we want to measure the result by AUC instead of the error, no problem. We can just specify this evil metric equals to AUC, and then we are automatically printing the information uh, of AUC. But this is only measured on the training data set. To predict, it's very simple and standard as other uh, R packages. You just use predict, and BST here is the object we just trained and the test data. So this is the test feature matrix. We can see the um, first few values from the prediction. Their probabilities. The next one, next very important thing is the cross validation. So let me, right let, me check with them. let me check yeah. with them uh, whether they're following along or have any sure. questions. Any questions so far? Can you switch back to your slides? Yeah. yeah, I think uh, back to the XBoost setting. The, BST, the definition for BST. Definition for BST is this one? Yeah. Any questions? So we want you to be able to do hands on afterwards. I'm trying to understand how the function works. Did you guys see why I'm muting myself? Every time yeah. we have ways, it's going to switch back. OK, Tom, you can switch back. Back to here, mm -hmm. cross validation here. Or, OK, so, so uh, I'm in charge again, right? OK. Um, so um, for cross-validation, it's very uh, important, uh, say, in a competition or in any other real-world experiment. So this is uh, both evaluating your predictive power as well as your uh, if you are overfeeding the training data. And so uh, you can compare these 
uh, function, the argument here, the, this function is fgb.cv. And with the argument here, you can see that everything is identical, except we have these additional uh, parameter that is indicating how many folds you want for this cross-validation process. So here we set it to five folds, and every other thing we can just copy and paste into this um, in this function, and that's everything. Now you can see that um, in the information we printed, we have the AUC measured on the training data set and the AUC measured on the test data set. So they are different. And usually we make our decision, so tune our parameters on the test AUC, which means this score. If we have more, there are uh, a lot of rows, and we can uh, investigate and look into what is the score. And the result, return result uh, of xgb.cv is a data table object so containing all the cross-validation results. So if we want to choose um, the largest AUC on test, we can just write a, a some simple R function to choose it. So it is very convenient. Okay, now let's come uh, look into a real-world experiment. The first time of extra boost is known by a lot of people was in the Higgs boson competition. Um, the competition is this one. It was uh, in the last year, lasted for four months, and there are nearly 2,000 teams participating in this, um, this competition. And here is a benchmark code that we, um, we posted in the forum of the competition. And you can see a lot of people is uh, voting up this one and a lot of uh, replies. And we offer a script on GitHub, which is the benchmark code. To run a script, you have to prepare a data directory and download the competition data into this directory. You can download them in, um, so first you find the competition in, on Kaggle, this Higgs boson, and you come to the data. This page, you download the training and testing, this two zip file, and you put them together with the um, code file under a data directory. Okay, so first we prepare the environment, require extra boost, and we set a test size equals to uh, 550,000. And then we can read in the data, so read the data from the data directory and the training.csv. Of course, we have to unzip it. And we uh, change the target. Uh, the target was a, a character that we are changing into a binary variable. And so labels and prepared data. And the weight, this part is a special thing for the competition. They offer a specified or manually specified weight for every data point. So we are utilizing this feature. And we are normalizing it. And now uh, the data contains missing values. And they are marked as minus 999 in the data. And we can construct an xgb.c matrix, which is xgb data matrix object, containing the information of weight and missing. So this is the xgboot the, um, our own data structure, we put the feature matrix and the training label and weight and the, uh, the missing value. So here is the minus 999 here. And we uh, put it into a actually mat. This object is of this class. And of course, we can also train the model directly on this data object. The next step is to set a basic parameters. There are some parameters. I will introduce them in detail in the later uh, after we have a sense of what is the model. So then we can put all the parameters here, and we input the data because we have already put the label along with the data and other information into this xgb.d matrix object. So we only have to put data equals to XGMAP. 
and we specify the number of times, the number of rounds we want to train the model, which is 120 here. Then we can read in the test data set. We read it and we extract the feature part. And we also transform it into a extra BD matrix uh, object because there's also missing values. And then we just do predict. On the model, we trained and on the data. Now here it is the test data set. Uh, XG map here, and wildprat is our prediction. And then this is the um, some codes to format our output to um, to follow the standard of the competition. And now we can run it in my R Studio. I just copy paste all the codes from the slides into my R Studio. You can see um, there's no, no more than 50 lines. I'm just going to run it. Um, wait a sec. You sure? OK. Um, can you see my R Studio? I, I think you can. So um, here is my code running. It is reading the training data. It takes some time here. Now, okay, now it, it is training. So there are uh, in total 120 rounds. So we can see every round, we can see the uh, AUC measured on the training data set and the AMS. And this AMS is a special evaluation metric proposed by those physicists. They pr used it as the uh, measurement in the competition. So we want to see both measurements as well. Yeah, we can do it. If you like, you can specify more. You just put several evil, evil metric here in the command. So here's AUC and here's AMS app. We can see it is um, improving. Yeah. Tone, why you choose one, 120? Is there some magic formula you calculate how many wrong? Uh, no, not yet. This is just a benchmark code. And to, I, I'm going to uh, talk about how do you choose the rounds later in the um, parameter part after the model specification. So here is just a demonstration on how this works and how good a score you can get just uh, with a very short time of training. I was loading the data again. And after that, we can um, submit the result to see how it works. Uh, Okay, the prediction is finished and has output value. So we can submit our result and I'll switch the screen to my browser. Yeah, I need some time to upload it. Okay, um, before we see the result, we can see here's a comparison of an other gradient boosting machines and other packages. So the highest line, the top line here is the um, gradient boosting machine from the Circuit Learn in Python. And the second one is the GBM package in R. And the third one is actually boost running on only one core. And Following our extra boost running on the two cores and the four cores, you can see there is a significant difference between extra boost and other existing gradient boosting machines. This is uh, measuring their efficiency, the running time. Okay. 
and so it's still up uploading. Um, so it's very slow here in my network. And after some feature engineering and parameter tuning, uh, you can achieve around 25th with a single model on the leaderboard. And here I'm giving you this link. And this is an article written by a former physicist uh, who is now a data scientist. Uh, and he participates in this competition. But he only knows how to use a single model. So he was uh, at the 25th in the uh, leaderboard. And he did some feature engineering and parameter tuning, and this article introduced them in detail. And actually, on our post-competition attempts, we achieved 11th on the leaderboard with a single extra boost model. So almost top 10, that means. OK, now uh, comes to the model specification. Oh, it's, um, I think the upload process is really slow. Um, I can show you the uh, leaderboard. You can have some interesting observations. So starting from um, this part, you can see a lot of people. They have the same score of 3.64 and 6.55. And this is a score generated by our benchmark code. So you can see a lot of people. They're using our benchmarks, but they're not improving it. Maybe because this uh, competition uh, was lasted for four months. That is too long for normal people to put every uh, every second into this one. So they just test it. But which uh, is also improving, uh, proving that our package is very popular among the Kaggle competition since it's first time introduced to them. Yeah, you can see that this is our uh, submission just now. We have the same score here. And this is 450 among there are almost yeah, 1,700 participants. I think this is top 25%. Uh, yeah. So um, is there any questions before we go into the model specification? Hi, Vivian. No questions? OK, good. So here we are going to talk about some mathematical details. I hope you're not, no, nobody's yelling and running out of the room. OK, um, our model is sum of a lot of trees. Every single, uh, or our model is an ensemble of a lot of weak classifier or weak models. Each model, weak model is a tree. We specified it by F, K here. And suppose we have capital K trees. And now our model is the sum of all the trees. And having all the decision trees, we make prediction by just simply sum all the prediction results from every tree. We just sum them up. And here, the xi is the feature vector for the i data point. And similarly, the prediction at the teeth step can be defined as the, with some of the first t trees. Because sometimes, because uh, we are training the uh, model uh, step by step, every time in every iteration, we add one tree. So at teeth step, we have our current prediction as y to the um, denoted by this t here. OK, first, uh, I will not touch the details of what is a tree and how we build a tree and such things. First, let's talk about a big picture. So to train a model, you need a training objective. You need to minimize or maximize something. So typically, we use the RMSE, rooted mean square error, for regression, which is this formula. And we use log loss for binary classification, which is here. Or multiple log loss for multi classification, which is the generalization of the log loss. And the first one, RMSE, is also the loss function for linear regression. 
And the second one, log loss, is also the loss function for a logistic regression. So in our, uh, when we are setting the objective, this parameter, we uh, specify them as rack and clone and regression uh, and linear or logistic clone uh, or binary clone logistic. So that is the reason. So we have different objectives. We have different goals. We want to minimize this L. And on the other hand, uh, we also need to regularize our model. So we don't want it to overfit. So here we propose this regularization term as in this formula. And here T is the number of leaves on a tree. And the uh, this WJ is the score on the Jth leaf of that tree. And we sum up, say, uh, since this tree has capital T lead, so we sum the square, square of them up. Yeah, and we have these um, gamma and lambda to control uh, the degree of the regularization. Okay, so put loss function and regularization together, we have our objective of the model. So in total, we want to minimize the loss function plus the regularization. And here, the last function controls the predictive power, and regularization controls the simplicity. Is there any question? I hope it's not. If there's not, uh, I'm going to continue. Okay, great. <clears throat> so here, in actually boost, we use gradient descent to optimize this objective. So uh, we just uh, stated abstractively, given an objective OBJ here, we measure the objective on the true target and our predictive target. And we calculate the gradient of our prediction. And the gradient is um, like the slope of a hill. So we know where the direction of the peak, so we know where we are marching to, so we can take a step further towards that direction. So that is the gradient descent. So we have to calculate the gradient. And um, so we're scared of this long formula. So we recall that definition of objective is L plus this omega. We plus them together. And write, uh, and write them in a larger form uh, formula. So we can see the L here is the sum of the loss function over all the data points. So here I is from one to N, which, we, which means we sum over all the data points. And plus, we measure all the uh, complexity of all the trees we've got so far. So this is small t, so this is t step. And here, the only difference between these two parts is uh, we decompose the y, the prediction at this step to the previous step and the current prediction. It's when we are calculating the t step tree, we have already the first t minus one trees fixed. So we only have to consider this ft here. So that is the reason we pull it out. And to optimize this function, we need to calculate the gradient. And we also consider both the first and second order gradient so that it can converge faster. And since actually sometimes we don't have derivative for every objective function, we calculate the second order Taylor approximation of it. So here's the form, and this is the loss function uh, for uh, first t minus one uh, models, and this g here is the gradient, and h here is the second order gradient of the loss function. And here is the form, and we remove the constant term, which means they are not related to this t step. So this is what we got. You can see here, we remove 
uh, the loss from the previous t minus one steps, and we remove all the complexity measures for the previous t minus one models. So this is what we left, and this is our goal at the t step, and we are trying to optimize it at the t step. Okay, is there any questions here? So this is our big picture of the model. Um, if not, then I will continue. Okay, now let's talk about the tree building algorithm. This is the core problem. How can we find a tree that improves the prediction along the gradient? Yeah, we were talking about minimization or maximization of the objective, but that f is a function, it's a tree, it's not a number. We cannot just assign it. We cannot just solve a, fun, uh, a formula to calculate it. So it's harder than the, uh, some normal gradient descent problem. So now let's see what is a decision tree. A tree looks like this. So um, it's a binary tree. And starting from a, a root, we can see uh, there are some nodes here, internal nodes here, and leaves here. For internal nodes, each data point, uh, starting from the root, first check the feature A, whether it's larger than one or not. If it is smaller than one, then we flow to the right. And this is another internal node. So we check the feature C here again. And if it's larger than six, if C is larger than six, then we flow to this one, still an internal node. If it's the D feature is smaller than four, then we assign nine to this data point. And for each data point, we put it from the top to the end. So it's like flow from the top to the bottom to a leaf. Once it reaches to a leaf, then it's going to be assigned by score. So every data point is going to end it in a leaf. And all the data points flow to these, the same leaf. They share the same score. So here, if you follow, flow to the um, leaf, the, the fourth leaf, and you are going to uh, assign a score of nine. OK, so here are two core concepts, the internal nodes. So they are responsible to split the flow of data points to the left or the right. And they split it by checking whether one of the features is above or below a threshold. And the leaf, the um, data points reach to a leaf at the end, and the weight is the prediction for those data points flow to this leaf. OK, so now we can ask two key questions. First is, how do we build uh, find a good structure? So you can see here, I said it's a binary tree, but it can be an arbitrary binary tree. It can have like 100 uh, uh, depth, or it can just be a single root. Or you can you can be really imbalanced. So how do we define uh, how do you find the good structure? And second one is how to assign a prediction score. So here on the leaf, why do we assign one to the first leaf and assign three to the second leaf? Is there a better scoring function, a scoring uh, strategy that we can take? Okay, so the, if we can solve these two problems, then we can train a tree at each step. In that big picture, we can iteratively repeat this step until we reach the maximum number of trees that is assigned by the uh, user. You have to specify number of trees previously. OK, so let's uh, solve the easier problem first. Let's assume that we already have a solution to question one, means we know how to find a good structure. So now the structure is fixed. Then we can define this tree mathematically as this formula. So the teeth tree here, f t x, equals to the w with the index of q x. So w is the score of tree uh, of leaves, and the q x is a, a indexing function that is guiding a data point to one leaf. It's directing a data point flow from the root and flowing uh, to the left or right 
and gradually ended in uh, on a on a leaf, and ended in a qx leaf. So the output of this function is the number of leaves. So this definition, we can know the prediction process on the tree is to assign a data point to a leaf, and we assign a corresponding score to this data point. <laughs> Okay, now we have an uh, index set. This ij is for the jth leaf. And th this set contains all the data points that flow to the jth leaf. Then we can rewrite the objective. So um, you don't have to look at them very closely or very uh, detailedly. You only have to know that the core problem uh, core idea is, in the first formula, we're summing up everything by the data points. We're summing up from i, uh, i equals to 1 to the n here, and we consider every data point separately. But now, in the second formula, we are uh, considering leaf by leaf. So with the index set, we know what are the data points assigned to the j leaf. And they're going to be assigned by the same score, because that is the um, idea for decision tree. So this is the form in the end that we are going to um, optimize. This is our objective function rewritten in this way. OK, so now observe. Now our, prop, uh, our task is to find a good leaf score, which is the wj here and wj square here to minimize this objective function. You can see that this is a quadratic question. Uh, so we can solve it analytically. There is only the square of wj and the square and the linear part of wj. So we can just use some math from high school. We know that the best wj equals to this formula and the corresponding value of the objective is this one. You don't have to remember them. You just have to know that we can assign a score analytically with the best solution. So the leaf score here, let's take a closer look at it. It relates to the first and second order of the loss function, uh, second order gradient of the loss function g here and h here and the regularization parameter, lambda, here. OK, um, is there any questions? So this is our, uh, how do you assign a score on leaves if we know the structure? Oh, no? OK, great. Okay, and next one, we come back to the first question. How do you find a good structure? And this is a little bit harder, more difficult than the previous one. And then we, so we split it into two sub-questions. The first is how to choose the feature to split. And the second is when to stop the split. In each split, we want to greedily find the best splitting point so that we for, uh, for each feature, we sort the numbers. And then we scan for the best splitting point. We are actually um, scanning from the uh, sorted numbers so that we set each number as a threshold to see what is the objective uh, score we've got if we split at this point and we scan it. So this is a linear process. It's really fast. And for each feature, we can get a, a, a score. And we compare them. We choose the best feature that is minimizing the objective the most. So how do we? compare the split, how do you calculate the best split? So in the split, we are uh, transforming a leaf into an internal node, and we add two sub-nodes to it. And these two sub-nodes are leaves. So here you can see that this is a leaf, this is w1 equals to 5. And we split it by the feature a here, and the threshold is 1. And there are two new leaves the w1 equals to 1 and w2 equals to 9. So there are different scores assigned to different data, uh, to 
uh, your data points flow to different leaves. I can calculate the gain of this process. So this is the score that we measure how much we gain from this process, or actually we are losing something. So uh, now is how we calculate the gain. Like usually um, in the traditional algorithms, they are calculating the gain by um, the Gini index or other measure of uh, entropy metrics, uh, uh, measures, but now we are different. Our measure is based on the objective. So we use the trick of the uh, index set again. So I here is a set of indices. There is um, a, a set of indices of data points in the previous leaf, which is this one. And IL and IR be the set of indices of data points assigned to two new leaves. So the data points flow to this one is IL, and data points uh, flows to this one is IR. Now we recall the best value of objective on the J leaf is this one. This is a formula. So the gain of the split is we cap we plus the two values from the in, from introducing the left leaf and the right leaf. I minus the uh, objective from uh, the previous leaf because we lose one leaf and get two new leaves. So we want to compare whether we are improving the objective or not. And plus this one. This is the um, parameter controlling the number of leaves. Because now we introduce one more leaf here from one leaf to two leaves. So we have to minus this gamma here. So this is controlling the complexity of our algorithm. So to build a tree, we find the best splitting point recursively until we reach to the maximum depth. And you can also specify this one when you're using it. And then we prune out the nodes with the negative gain in a bottom-up order. So we first build it to a full binary tree, and then we start to pruning. Uh, to prune, uh, the pruning process is we starting from all the leaves at the bottom, and we check what is the gain, what is the value of gain by this split. If this uh, gain is positive, then we keep it. If the gain is negative, then we delete those two new leaves, and we turn the father into a leaf. And so the, tree, the complexity is reduced by this pruning process. And why do we um, uh, grow it until, uh, to the uh, maximum depth? Because sometimes you can, you can meet a negative gain in the middle part, but then later you're starting to gain, gain a lot more. So uh, it's better to keep the negative um, part in the middle of the tree. And then we prune it out uh, in the next step. OK, um, so so far, is there any questions? Oh, perfect. And additionally, attributes can handle missing values in the data. So I believe it is a highlight. I don't know. Actually, I don't know any other implementation, at least. They can handle missing values. Or if you know, you can, uh, you, you're very welcome to email me and tell me. And for each node, if there is a missing value, we guide all the data points. Um, so we get the data point with a missing value first to the left subnode and calculate the maximum gain by this operation. And then we guide it to the right subnode and calculate the maximum gain by this operation. Then we compare uh, which one uh, is generating a higher gain. So we choose the direction with a, lar uh, a larger gain. So that is, on this node, we prefer to believe um, all data with missing value tend to be guided to the left or right. So this is like a default direction for missing values. So uh, every time we, want, we are uh, flowing at a point from the root to the leaf, if we have a missing value, on the feature that is checking by some one of the internal nodes, then internal node will just directly guide in it to the left or right based on the default direction. 
Okay, now to sum up, the outline of the algorithm is to iterate for n round times. This n round is the parameter you set, or the capital K in our model. And we grow the tree to the maximum depth and find the best bleeding point, assign weight to the new leaves. These two uh, steps are our two questions we asked and solved previously. And after we grow it to the maximum depth, we prune the tree to the lead nodes with negative gain. And then we have the tree at the teeth step, and we do repeat it for the t plus one step until we reach the maximum number of uh, iteration. Okay, so that is the end of the model specification. Is there any questions? I believe uh, not. So I'm gonna continue. Or is there any? I have a question. Okay. Is the missing data same as sparse data? Uh, not really. Um, you don't have to set it. So sometimes there's just one feature. Say uh, I have 100 features, and one of the features have 10 missing missing values. They, uh, you can also treat them as missing value. And of course, in the sparse matrix, uh, those um, those and those points without observation, they are treated as the missing value. Is there any question? No, the yes or no. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's asking. He's asking yours. Yours. It's a yes or no. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I missed the problem. Uh, question. Sorry. Can you ask again? Is is the missing value be used for sparse data? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. sure. In the sparse data, the unobserved data points are treated as missing value. So, am I answering the question? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. So um, now we have an idea of the model, so we can uh, look into the parameters. So as you can see, we have plenty of parameters. We can group them into three large groups. The first is general parameters. There is number of threads. Uh, say the threads of the CPU CPU that you want to to use for extra boost. And the second one is the booster parameters. Say the step size and regularization and a lot of say for the tree. And the third is the task parameters. So what is the objective you're evaluating? You, you're maximizing, and how do you evaluate your result? So um, there's a quick way to check the parameters. The first way is you can look into this function, actually b.train. And you can just type question mark and actually b.train. You can see there are detailed documentation of all the parameters. And the second one is the documentation in the repository in the GitHub repository. So here the link is from Xreboost, and we have a doc folder. And here's parameters.md, this is a markdown. And you can see there are uh, introductions in detail and they have everything. Yeah. And so here I'm going to uh, briefly introduce them so you have an idea what are the functions we offer. Um, so general parameters, that is the in thread, number of uh, parallel thread, and the booster. You want to use a tree-based model or a linear function. We also support boosting from a linear function, but that is uh, usually I don't use it. This is just for um, benchmarks and for not overfeeding, but accuracy is not comparable to a tree-based model. And the parameters for tree booster, the so first is ADA. Every time we add a new tree to the model, we don't want to take the full step. Maybe we want to shrink the step smaller to smaller size. So this is the scale of how, how much you want to keep for the new tree. So the range is in 0 to 1, and the default value is 0 0.3. And here, gamma is the minimum loss uh, reduction required to make a split. So gamma is actually controlling 
the um, number of trees, just like in in this part. So here's gamma. Uh, the gain here, although maybe we can have some uh, gain from a splitting, but if we are introducing too much the um, complexity, then we're the gain will still be negative. So it is controlling our splitting. The range is from zero to to infinity, default is zero, so it's not controlling at all. And the max depth, the max depth of the tree and the range is first, uh, the one to the infinity, default is six. And here's uh, another thing, it's not in the model specification, it's the minimum sum of instant weight needed in the trial. So if you want to do a split, sometimes there are too few data points flowing to this leaf. So in that case, it's not a good idea to split it. So this is also controlling that uh, value. So by default, this value is one. And the max data step is uh, the maximum that uh, we allow on each tree's weight estimation to be. So that is the maximum weight on the leaf. It is control. Um, if it's zero, then it means there's no control on it and the default is zero. And these two, and the first is subsample, means every time we build a tree at one step, we take a sample of all these data points, so we are not using the full data point, so that we introduce the randomness in it, so we are making the model uh, more robust and uh, avoid overfeeding. And the following, the next, uh, this one is the same, so this is um, a column sample by tree, so that is every time we only use a subset of feature, we don't use every feature. And this is a, and both of them are the ratios. The range is from zero to one, and you can't set it to zero because we're using nothing. And for a linear booster, you can set lambda. Of course, this lambda is also for the tree uh, booster. For a linear booster, the lambda here is the L2 regression term on weight. And alpha here is the L1 regulation term on weight. And lambda bias is the L2 regulation term on the bias term. So all of them are set to be zero by default. So they're not, there's no regularization by default. And now for objectives, we have the following. The uh, re regression and linear, the linear regression, this is default option. And this is optimizing the squared loss or MSE. And in binary log logistics, this is optimizing the um, log loss. And multi softmax, this is optimizing the M log loss. And by uh, using these objectives, you have to specify num, num class this parameter. This is indicating how many classes are there in total uh, in your multi classification uh, mission. Because sometimes, if you're say if you're doing cross validation. So sometimes your uh, folds, one of your folds containing only, say, uh, if you have nine classes in total, so there's only eight or even seven classes. So this is misleading. It's not good for, uh, for us to format the predict, uh, prediction. So you have to specify this or user specified objective. Uh, this, yeah. And for evaluation, we have RMSE and log loss and error the uh, classification error and AUC and the uh, multi-classification error and multi-class log loss or some some other things you specify. Use the specified evaluation metric. Okay, uh, is there any questions so far? If no, um, then I'll continue. Uh, here are some um, my personal guide on parameter tuning. Maybe you are more experienced than me that I'm just uh, giving some brief introduction. Actually, it's, it's impossible to give you a set of parameters, and I say that you can achieve the top one on any data set by this specific set of parameters. It's impossible. So for every new mission, we have to tune the parameters differently. But there are some key points or ideas I usually follow. The first is you have to control your overfitting. And the second is uh, you have to be careful about imbalanced data. And third is trust your cross-validation. 
say uh, if you are in a competition, then more than the public uh, leaderboard. The first one, the um, overfeeding, we call it a bias variance trade-off, or you can call it accuracy simplicity trade-off. And in XGBoost, to control the model complexity, we have the depth of the tree and the minimum weight, uh, child weight for a split and the gamma controlling number of leaves. And you can also make it robust noise by introducing randomness in the samples and features by subsample and call them subsample by tree. And if you have an imbalance uh, data among classes, you can balance the positive and negative weights by this uh, by this parameter. If you only care about the ranking order, you can use AUC as the evaluation metric rather than the uh, evaluation error, uh, the classification error. Say, uh, say if you have your positive and negative um, data points, say with one versus nine, then you predict everything as the negative, then you can have your um, classification error of uh, only 10%. So you can see it's almost perfect, but it is not. If you also care about predicting the right probability, you cannot rebalance the data set. You can uh, set parameter this one to a smaller number will help convergence. But uh, training on the uh, bias uh, imbalance uh, data set is not that easy if you want to have the right probability. And to select idea, ideal parameters, you use the result from xgb.cv more than the result on the public leaderboard. Because usually the public leaderboard, that is only a small portion of all the test data sets, say, uh, 15 percent or 20 percent so you're measuring your uh, performance on a very small subset of the data and in cross-validation you have uh, k-fold and you're actually looking at the average of the performance on k-fold so that is even more robust than the public leaderboard and uh, this is an early stop round a feature and I'm going to introduce it in a minute and if overfitting observed in your cross validation, say uh, you are trying to iterate over, uh, for 1,000 rounds and you observe that after 700 rounds, the um, performance on test set starts to decrease, then you can, um, you can reduce the um, step size ADA and increase your number of rounds a little bit because say your ADA was 0.1 and the number of rounds is, say, uh, 1,000, and you decrease the ADA to 0 0.01, then every tree, the contribution of it is smaller, so you need more rounds to reach to a satisfying uh, result. So we usually reduce step size ADA and increase in rounds at the same time. So any questions here? OK, great. So here are some advanced features for this package. So there are a lot of highlights here. Uh, say you can customize your objective function and evaluation metric. It can uh, take the prediction from cross-validation. And you can continue training on an existing model. And you can calculate and plot a variable importance. So first is the customization here. So according to our model and algorithm, uh, you can see that the leaf weight only relies on the first order and second order of gradient of the loss function. So you can use your own loss function instead of those RMSE or log loss we provided, as long as you can calculate the gradient and the second order gradient of your loss function. So that you can put, you can write a function to calculate it and feed it to extra boost, and it will optimize this one. So now for uh, demonstration, we just rewrite the log loss function. So and the formula of it uh, for the i data point is the yi and pi, and uh, yi times the log of probability plus one minus yi 
times the log of one minus the probability. And why I here is the uh, true true target value. And PI is calculated by applying the logistic trans uh, transformation on our prediction. So we expand it into this longer one. And we can do the um, calculus. We can calculate the derivatives. So we can see the form of the gra uh, gradient and the second order gradient is very simple. So you can translate it into the code, into our code. So here's the complete code. This is log reg logistic regression objective. Uh, it takes uh, two parameters. The first is the prediction, and the second is the this D train is the X3BD matrix uh, that is generated inside the XREBoost. So first, we extract the label, which means the two target values. And then we calculate the PI here by applying the logistic transformation. And then we calculate the first gradient and the second gradient. We just return it by a list in a list. The grad is grad and has is the hashing matrix or second order gradient. This has. Then we're we're done here. And we can also customize the evaluation metric. This eva eval error. So we are just uh, demonstrating by calculating classification error. And the same here. We first extract the true label. And then we calculate the error. And in the end, we return the name of this metric. So it's called error or called whatever you want. And the value is the number we just calculated here. Okay, so to utilize the customized objective and evaluation, we can just feed them here to the objective. It's the name of our function. And the evil metric is the name of our function in the primary. And then we can train it. Now this arrow is uh, the result by our evaluation metric. And it is trained on our uh, objective. And the next one is prediction in cross-validation. So this is mostly used in uh, stacking strategy. Say, in a competition, sometimes we don't want to only use a single model. Sometimes we want to combine several models. One of the way is to use a train several models and use their prediction as a second order of features. And we train another higher order, uh, another strong classifier or a regression model on top of these features and to stack them to make a stack. So this is called stacking. Um, or uh, sometimes people call it uh, a blending in, in Kaggle forum. And so to avoid overfeeding, uh, so if we train on the uh, training data and we then uh, predict on training data, then it is definitely going to overfeeding because we are now predicting we are feeding. So um, one of the ways is to use the prediction from cross-validation. So we cut the data into k folds. And for each fold, there's a round that the, it is the test fold. So we can make prediction on this fold. And we loop through uh, this process for k times. And for every fold, we have the predictive uh, value on this fold. And we concatenate them together into one vector. So we have our model's prediction on this training data set. Yeah, you, you can also implement it by your own, but we offer a very convenient uh, way that is just specify prediction equals to true. Okay, so this is the result. The rest is the result from attribute.cv. We can see the structure of it. The first is the uh, data table, which is the training error and test error, this data table. And the second uh, member of this list is the pre prediction. You can see this is the prediction from our and cross-validation. So you can simply just use it to as one of the features in your stacking process. And this one, and we have already introduced this one a little bit, the attribute.b matrix. Yes, um, yes, we have introduced the model. So uh, every time we want to uh, split a feature, we have to sort them and scan. That is very time consuming. The sorting is a algorithm of O of O of n log n. And in this XGBD matrix, 
we pre-sort it. So this is a pre-processing. Then uh, every time we want to find a split, it is linear. We don't have to sort them anymore. So this is saving some time. So this is another reason why extra boost is fast. And another uh, advantage of it is if you want to repeat training process on the same big data set, then because it's big, then the pre-processing might be a concern. Uh, the pre-processing time might be a concern. So it's good to use this one to save some pre-processing time. And then uh, actually the, uh, the matrix object contains the pre-processed training data and several other features, say the uh, missing values and data weight and the labels. And the next one I'm going to introduce, this is continued training. So sometimes you want to train a model for a lot of rounds if you have a relatively smaller eta that is a set size. So, um, but sometimes if you want to train a model with 5,000 rounds, and that is okay, but you might meet the uh, the problem that you are overfeeding at the 1,000 rounds. So um, a better strategy is to train a model with fewer rounds, and then we see how it performs. And if it's not good enough, we continue to add say five rounds, and to train it and evaluate it and train it again. We can repeat it, so we don't have to build all the trees from scratch. We can continue the training based on the existing trees. Okay, so um, this is the code pieces. So um, we only train it for one round. That is just for a uh, demonstration. Here you can see the training error. This is trained with only one round. And next, this uh, this code is with output margin equals to true. So this margin means the previous t trees uh, the, the score generated by the previous t trees, and then we set these uh, value in the uh, d train these actually boost and uh, actually be d matrix object. So this is the name of the object. This is our uh, training data, and this is the name of the information we want to set, and this is the value of that information. So we set in full. So this base margin so um, means the previous t trees, their result is this value. So you can continue on top of this thing. Then we train it again, training one round. So you can see the training error is much smaller than this one, which means it is improving from this step. So it is continuing the training process. And you can also investigate the importance of the features. You can also plot the trees. So to uh, investigate importance is easy. You first run the extra boost training as usual with some parameters here. And then you just uh, run the extra B dot importance. So you can, um, this is the name of all the features. If you are inputting a a matrix, it has to have a, a column name or, and along with this uh, character vector. And the model is the BST is the booster we trained. And you can see here the features. We have um, four features. And they're called 28, 55, 59, and 108. And this gain here is the sum of all the gain value every time we split on this feature. The larger this value is, the more meaningful this feature is. Because the gain is, if we split on it, um, the two leaves are contributing more than the old leaf. So the gain is um, positively related to the contribution, to the importance of the feature. And we can also plot the trees in the model by this x3b.plot.tree. We offer a function here, xgb.plot a tree, and the uh, input arguments are the same as this importance. Oh. So here's the tree. We only train uh, two trees, so you can see this is the first one, and uh, this is the gain here, and this is the second tree, and this is the leaf, and this is two leaves. You can see their structures, 
and you can see the threshold here. You can see the gaining at each step. And here's the final uh, highlight I'm introducing today. And this is early stopping. And this is uh, if you are training for 5,000 rounds and you observe uh, it starts to overfit at the uh, 1,000 round, then the last 4,000 rounds is just a waste of time. You want to stop it. And here we measure it gets worse if it uh, gets worse for consecutively, say, three rounds on the test set. You can uh, specify it to 10, then it is asking uh, it to stop if uh, the performance on test set is um, it keeps getting worse for 10 rounds. So here's the test. Uh, oh, um, yeah, here we see that the end round is 20. But now starting from the uh, second one, we're not uh, starting from the uh, 13 step. Oh, it starts from zero, so it's 14 here. So from the 14 step, we're not improving it anymore. And you keep going for three rounds, and I found that it stays at the same value, so it stops here. So it can tell you that the best iteration is 14. Okay, so far, is there any problem? Any questions? Okay, great. Now it's a Kaggle winning solution if you're using Nashi Boost. So um, to get a higher rank, actually a competitor needs to push the limit of these following three aspects. First is feature engineering. You have to extract some meaningful features. And the second is parameter tuning. You overfeed and dig the power of your model. And the third is model ensemble. That is combine all the models you know to or add them together to make an ensemble model that is uh, improving the result. So recently, there is a um, competition called Odo. So there are more than 3,000 teams in it. It is the biggest, largest uh, competition so far on Kaggle. And the winning solution is an excellent example of, um, of this pipeline. So uh, here's the uh, post on the forum. You can also see it. The title is first place. And if you're interested, you can see it uh, in this competition's forum, Auto Group uh, Product Classification Challenge. <laughs> okay, so briefly, um, they use a three-layer ensemble learning model, including, so first they introduce 33 models on top of the original data. And then they train actually boost a neural network and an adaptive boost on 33 predictions from the um, previous stage, and they have eight engineered features. And third, they, wait, they use the weighted average of the three predictions from these three models from the second step. And so they get a final result. And the data for this competition is special. So the meaning of the features are, the, the meaning of features are hidden, so you don't know what it is. So how do they, generated features. The first is uh, distance to nearest neighbor of each three, uh, each classes. And the sum of distance and uh, of two nearest neighbor and four nearest neighbor. And they use a TFIDF and TSNE. And TSNE is a very, very brilliant um, data visualization algorithm. And uh, clustering features of original data sets and the number of non-zero elements in each row. And um, these are requires a lot of work because actually um, they have to try a lot of other methods, way more than this 33 method and the engineered features. And uh, they have some failed attempts. So they uh, use this uh, Valpo Webit. Maybe this tool is not suitable for this specific competition. And uh, they also try the following uh, models or packages and some pre-processing and feature selection and other uh, semi-supervised learning. So it's a great effort to put if you want to 
have a good result on the KO competition. Okay, and then now I'm going to uh, demonstrate how you can use a single extra boost model to get into a top 10 of a, a competition. And that competition is a easier one, so we can have it in time, so we're not uh, doing it too long. So the competition we choose is this one, Influencers in Social Network uh, competition. So this, this was a hackathon two years ago in 2013. The data um, is um, some statistics on some Twitter users. So for each user, they count their posts, their followers, uh, who their number of uh, people they're following, and their mentions and retweets. And then they compare the uh, two users they, uh, by pair, and they have some human maybe specialist to assign, say, if you are comparing A and B, so the, um, the specialist will say A is more influential than B, so they mark it as one, or A is not, is less influential than B, then the market is zero. So we are trying to classify whether A is more influential than B, and this is a binary um, classification based on their uh, Twitter statistics. And the size of the data is only 5,500 data points. So it's small enough. So uh, you can download the data. Um, just find influencers in social networks. And you download the data here. And you can download the train and test. Um, the first, we load them in. And we train it. Uh, and, and we uh, transform in the first uh, column as the target, so here's Y, and we transform them into matrix. So let's first observe the data. So you can see these are the names of the data, the follower count, and this is for user A, follower count, following count, listed count, and mentions received, retweets received, and mention stands, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And a same, the same thing for user B. So for user A, they have 11 features, and for B as well. So in total, we have 22 features for each comparison. And we can observe the data. This is the first row. You can see that they are all numerical data. So we don't have to use some one-hot encoding to uh, deal with the categorical data or other things. And the data contains information from two users and this type of data gives us some room for feature engineering. Okay, so here is the first trick. Every data point can be expressed as the Y, A, B. So Y is the target, whether A is stronger than B. If it is, then it's one, otherwise it's zero. And A is the feature vector of A, and B is the feature vector of B. Actually, it also indicates that one minus Y, B, and A, if you swap, the, uh, the position of B and A, then we are comparing, we're considering whether B is stronger than A, and the answer is obviously opposite of the previous uh, answer, so we use one minus Y. So we can just enhance the number of data points we have by a factor of two, by just switch the location of uh, the, the position of features, and we, com and we uh, combine them again. So here we use a new train, we swap, the features, and then we combine them again. We combine the target with min one minus it. So now we have uh, 11,000 of data points, twice as before. And then the following, we are uh, doing some other feature engineering steps, and they are done on both training and test data sets. So it's more convenient to combine them together, as uh, we call it the uh, variable just as x. And we can do it, uh, there are some uh, ratios that we can calculate. The um, ratio of followers versus following, and mentions received versus sent, and retweets received versus sent, and blah, 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 and so on. So we can calculate it, calculate them as well. So we write them, because they are um, the i throw against the j throw, 
So we just calculated. And the lambda here is to, for smoothing. Because sometimes uh, that um, people just have zero posts, then we're dividing it by zero. It's not good. So we can calculate it like a brute force. And we write a lot of codes here. And then we combine them together. Then we can also compare the differences between the uh, between A and B, because the tree tree based model is scale invariant. Every time it scan over a feature, it just set a threshold whether this feature is um, larger than something or smaller than something, and um, it doesn't matter whether it is normally distributed or uniformly distributed. It doesn't care. It just care the relative ranking of it. So it's scale invariant. Therefore, minus and division are, the essential, are essentially the same. So now we just uh, calculate the first uh, 17 features. That is the feature for user A minus the last 17 features. That is for uh, feature user B, uh, user B. And uh, we, we have the A, B, dot, this. And we com uh, combine them by column together. So now we have our new train and task data set. So now uh, we finish this simple feature engineering part. Now it comes to the modeling part. We first investigate, uh, uh, we investigate how far can we grow, uh, go with a single model. So here's the actually uh, actually B.CV, this is cross validation. So you just uh, set some random uh, parameters to see how it goes. And we plot the performance because we have the uh, results generated, the result on the training and testing generated. We can see that on this plot, uh, we have a growing uh, in performance on the training set, but we have a, a performance on the test set decrease really fast. So this is a green line. So it means we are overfeeding, so we have to um, get rid of it. And now it seems that suddenly we come to a large part of parameters. But usually, uh, what, what I did, uh, what I do is uh, starting from um, this formula, I will observe whether we have a, uh, a problem of overfeeding. Or I, I can demonstrate it in the um, R Studio, so you can have a, you can know what happens. Um. Okay, so first, let's um, do the feature engineering part. Okay, so it's done. And here the set seed is to make sure that our result is reproducible. Oh, oh I'm, I'm setting the uh, variables, which means whether to print the output or not. Nope, now it's running. We can see the training AUC is improving, but the test AUC is decreasing, so it's getting worse and worse. Now we, it's obvious that we have to adjust it. So one simple idea is to, um, because the ETA, the step size, was 0 0.3 by default, but now we want to decrease it. See, uh, we set it to 0 0.03, and we increase it to 500. Remember here, the uh, best result we've got is the um, 0.862 or 0.86, yeah, 0.864 here. So let's see if we can get a better result than it. Than it. Yeah, so you can see that because we are having a smaller step size, so we're improving, we're pushing the result to a better place. And um, and then, well, we can even push it further 
by decreasing the adder filter and increase the number of rounds, we can also introduce other parameters here. But it's just a matter of time. You have to um, try and test. Okay, so now we can observe that is uh, there is a uh, decreasing on the test AUC here, and we know we are overfeeding here. Okay, um, set it to five hundred. We can stop it, and then we can add something sub sample equals to zero point seven. So every time I'm training it, I'm j just using seventy percent of the data for each iteration for each tree, so they are not overfitting too much, I'm introducing randomness to it. So let's see whether it's going to uh, decrease so fast or not. And there are other um, parameters introduced here, say the col column sample by tree and the minimum trial weight is the default value. And I reduced the maximum depth of the tree it was by default six, but now I set it to four. And uh, gamma to one, it was zero and lambda, they are controlling the uh, complexity of the tree. And here, actually, you can see the ADA is really small, 0 0.005, and around is 3,000. So it's asking for some time to train it. Okay, so now it decreased even faster than the previous time. So maybe 0 0.7 is not a good number, because we are using too few number of samples that is harming our prediction um, predictive power. So yeah, so it's a trial and test for me. Of course, you can use, there are some um, Gaussian process or some um, genetic algorithm that is helping you to uh, tune the parameters. You can also use them. But for me, I uh, I personally don't have experience with them. But if you have them and you're using them with uh, extra boost, I'm very, well, very welcome to share your experience. And now uh, with this set of parameters, I tune it for a bit time. Um, maybe for half an hour, and I trial and, and test and trial. Yeah, and this is another advantage of XGBoost. If you are using some slower implementation, then these uh, use the data parameter, and then you have to sit there and wait for the result. Then you know what you have to do in the next step. So if there is a fast uh, response, then you know what to do in a faster cycle. So I can do it in, in half an hour or 40 minutes. I can get such a bunch of parameters. We can see the trend of AUC and training and test that. So you can see it's, uh, it's not decreasing anymore, and it's good. And so we can extract the best number of iterations. Uh, we just extract the, um, the uh, AUC on the test set, and this one, and in, in the result here, um, you can see there is the uh, test, uh, the mean of test AUC, and the standard deviation on test AUC. So um, this means it's not stable. So we consider the worst case that is it reaches to the lower bar of the result. So we use the mean minus the standard deviation as a measure of the uh, worst case that we're going to get if we choose these number of rounds. So we calculate for each row. We use the, the third column minus the fourth column, and we find the maximum number of it. So we know that the best round is 2,442. We can see that the result here, we have a test AUC. The mean, the mean of it is uh, 0 0.876, which is which is larger than what we got we, what we've got here. So uh, comparing these two, this is xgb.cv, this is cross validation, and this is xgboost. We just copy everything from cross validation to here, and delete the enfold parameter, and then we make prediction. And we can use it as entry limit. Here's the parameter. We can set it to how many trees we use for the prediction. We can just use it, uh, set the best round we found. 
which is 2400 and so on. And finally, we just um, format it and we write it and write it to the our hard disk. And this can achieve a top top 10. Actually, it is the 10 on the leaderboard. Uh, I pre-calculated just before this talk. And I can make a submission here, I guess. And you can see, so this is the tenth of this competition. And this is only the result for a uh, from a single actually boost model. If you combine them, say by stacking or introducing other models, say logistic or SBM, the, uh, the result will, of course, be further improved. OK, I think uh, that is the end of this talk today. And thank you for listening. So is there any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Um, okay. How many of you want to try this in Python competition? You can do small group file. Next week. Um, next Wednesday, we have streaming Python in Hadoop events given by our instructor of the digital engineering. If you can come like one hour early, we can do a small Python competition by absolute guidance here just come one hour earlier also tomorrow we have open house for the design if you're interested it's going to be in the 16th floor okay thank you so much if you so have your email we're going to send a slide in the code after this thank you so much thank you. Thank, you. thank you tom good job thank you